Hi everyone. Today I'm here to talk about tuning the Linux TCP for data center networks. Um, I've heard like three really cool EVPA talks in the morning. So I'm glad to start with uh, more like networking focus kind of the topic. So this is the outline of my talk. Um, we're going to talk about what the data center network look like and how do we tune for TCP network performance. But equally important, I'll talk about how do we tune for the host performance as well as TCP visibilities for the network. And I'll talk about like the challenges of how TCP can survive in the next uh, uh, decade in the data center networking. Uh, but before I start, I want to introduce a little bit about myself. I work uh, in Google for um, a long time, uh, focusing mostly on the TCP performance for both internet and the data center networking. Um, the work I'm talking about here is actually a collective work by many people, all these Linux NetDev contributors in the Google network infrastructure. So uh, kudos to them uh, for this uh, really cool joint work. And um, my talk today is not specifically about what we have done at Google, but more or less uh, best practice and experiences in how we tune the TCP uh, performance uh, at Google data center networks. So let's start with the data center networks. Uh, the network basically has many hosts interconnect at the GBPS links uh, with some um, less than millisecond uh, latency. And we use the ECMP protocol to load balance for all the flows onto the, uh, the links. The links obviously are like shared by all this uh, host. It's not a full mesh, but that's why many hosts have to share the links together. And the application, um, a typical workload is a scatter getter. And that's why you have correlated bursts from many hosts at the same time. So many, many flows sharing the links competing with each other. And the applications care about latency and CPU and memory resources. So it's important to you strike the balance among all these metrics. And because of this sort of uh, application workload mapping to this network topology, then you have actually bottlenecks occur in host and the networks. Um, but usually those are invisible to the applications. Applications, when they start the communication operation, they see everything underneath as the network uh, code. Um, so for us to, to really tune the TCP performance, um, the application usage is really critical. Uh, for us to profile and know where to go to optimize TCP. Let's start with the data center application. Um, the topology, uh, sorry, the data center uh, uh, topology, not the application. Um, so basically you have all the hosts uh, that's connected to a top of rack switch, which is the green little button uh, there. And then they again uh, go up one layer and you have all these switches interconnect each other um, so that the forms a uh, basic three tier C loss uh, topology. Um, but the way to think is that essentially it's not a full mesh network and the application in order for hosts to talk to each other, you often have to traverse up and down, sharing the links with other hosts um, in order to um, communicates freely uh, among many different hosts. And a typical host, usually a server, has many thousands to millions of TCP flows at the same time. Um, they are not always active. Um, you can think the application basically multiplex all these messages across them uh, constantly. That means for a particular TCP flow, it's, a lot of time it's idle and then burst and then idle and the application just spread all these messages on these flows. So the way to think is, it's not a bulk 
transfer that uh, goes for a long time. It's like periodic burst and the flow usually lives a long time, but it also idles for uh, uh, a lot of time. But it's many, many flows competing at the bottlenecks at the same time. So how do we optimize TCP network performance in this setting? Um, ideally, uh, what you want is you want to maximize the bandwidth um, utilization across all these links available provided to you with the minimum queue because you don't want to build the network queues. If anything, you want to use the condition control so that you move the queue from the network to the host. Um, and at the host level, uh, when the queue is built at the host level, then you can selectively prioritize which message to send uh, next. Instead of if the queuing is happening in the network, there isn't much thing you can do because the switch is just going to forward them in the relatively FIFO order. And that's the idea to use a good congestion control, uh, which we will recommend uh, use ECTCP or the BBRB2 congestion control. Uh, they both utilize the ECN uh, signals, so you do have to turn that on. Uh, but you can immediately improve um, this kind of minimizing the queue while maximizing the bandwidth uh, situation. Because the default uh, congestion control cubic, uh, the way uh, the principle, the way it works is you try to push shuffle packets into the network as fast as possible until the queue blows up and will cause losses. But by that time, there is just too much queuing in the network and you would rather keep the queuing at the host. So in addition to that, what you want to do is you want to minimize the restart overhead, meaning that you want to keep persistent connections and prefer just reduce any kind of setup overhead. For example, you can use the TCP fast open that put data in the scene to even reduce one round trip uh, to start your applications. And equally important is this default setting that the TCP has is that if you leave a TCP uh, connection idle, it would every RTO reduce the congestion window by half. So if it idles for just a few milliseconds, that's long enough for the congestion window to reduce all the way to the default value. And you do want to disable that because that means you kind of like restart the probing all the time. And because you idle a lot, that means you essentially are restarting with a default C win, uh, which is not ideal. But there is a side effect to that is that, well, instead of restarting at the initial C win, you are starting with the last non C win, which can be a full window burst. So if you imagine that there's 1 million flows all bursting, at the full window, and that could indeed cause uh, severe congestion. And the best way to mitigate that we found is that you want to introduce TCP pacing here. So instead of doing a direct uh, full C1 burst, you want to pace them over a round trip of time. Uh, and with the FQ, which you mix a lot of different flows together, so while they are traversing in the network, they naturally will leave. So maybe they will leave this interposed uh, sort of a breathing room so you can mix and match uh, well. So to reduce sort of the burst induced uh, Q pressure. So both are all very effective uh, that we have used internally at Google. And another feature that we want to, uh, we think that are very useful is that uh, for a very, very long time, right? Uh, basically the way TCP works is you start on a path and inside the data center, it's pretty much fixated uh, because the routing has sort of programmed that where you need to go. But with uh, some data center have converted to IPv6, there is this really cool thing that you can do, which is called the flow label in the IPv6 header where you can specify essentially it's a 20 bits header that you can use that to indicate sort of the path you want to do. It's different than the source routing, but what we do is we have the switches take this flow label in addition to the, um, the four tuples 
uh, to use that to determine what's the next egress port you use. So every time you choose, you change the flow label, that means the switch may forward the packet on a different path. Um, so how do we use this uh, thing to sort of uh, repass the TCP dynamic dynamically? What we do is, since we know if the TCP flow is experiencing congestion or not from the existing congestion control, we can use that as a hint to change that um, the flow label. And we can even use things like a uh, round trip timeout um, RTOs to signify that there could be a potential link failure or severe congestion. So what we have done is that we make TCP be able to kind of swiftly change different paths if it detects either a potential link failure or a potential hotspot. Um, so in this picture, what I'm showing is that there is a flow that's traversing a hot link. And then because of TCP congestion control of that flow sense that, then it changed the flow label of the outgoing packets. And then the switch will hash it to a different uh, path. It's not guaranteed to be the sort of the better path. It could be also a hotspot. But if you continue to do that, then uh, the system will start converging and basically the energy will move from the hot spot to the cooler spots. It's a little bit like you're driving down the highway where you're stuck behind, a, say, a slow truck. Then basically you were trying to spread, you were trying to move lens uh, in this way uh, to low balance uh, the system itself. Uh, this is a feature that we just published in the SICCOM uh, this year called the uh, protective load balancing, and we uh, like to upstream the code uh, very soon for DCTCP. Uh, it requires uh, almost very, very small change to TCP in order to achieve this very cool load balancing feature. Um, so it's a dynamic flowlet that we have used um, and we found it very effective. Then I want to talk about the TCP WAN performance uh, because it's actually equally important. Um, in our data center, we do have, say, customers, internet customers, right? Google Telecom visitors um, coming into the data center, and these are all web performance. And at the same time, you also have some either latency sensitive uh, traffic, let's say some global controller traffic, or throughput sensitive data replication traffic across geographically diverse data centers. So both latency and throughput are pretty important in here. But for when, since the round trip time is already high, the first priority is to reduce the round trips because the round trip delay is already high. And you apply the similar technique, you use persistent connections, and you disable slow start after idle. And if you do have packet loss, you want to be able to recover that in sort of fast recovery, round trip time at clock manner, uh, instead of like timeout and then you go through this exponential back off. Um, so we would recommend using the rack TLP, which is already the default uh, in TCP to maximize the fast recovery. And in order to boost the throughput, what well, we found out the the, actually, the number one issue um, is that our current Linux default TCP buffer size is usually too small. If you really have a very long haul links with GBPS links, uh, for example, from London to Singapore, it's eas easily 200 millisecond or higher. And in that case, you need to properly size um, the TCP buffer and you can already get good performance. And if your WAN links also suffers this kind of uh, uh, bursty losses, when you collide with the local data center burst, you want to use something that's less loss sensitive, like a VBRV2 as well. Uh, these are also very uh, effective uh, techniques uh, to ensure the WAN performance. So I've talked about all the network uh, performance and I'm going to move into sort of the TCP uh, CPU and memory efficiency uh, as we found that that's are equally important uh, to the applications. Um, and there are essentially are many bottlenecks uh, in the host. Um, the obvious ones are the copies between all the send and receive 
uh, could be extensive for all the IO intensive uh, applications. And the user space and kernel process handling the same socket can be scheduled on different CPUs and that can cause a lot of uh, uh, overhead uh, as well. And the other ones I mentioned that the current data center applications um, is many flows exchanging small messages. And what you want to do is that you really want to minimize the wake up um, or the boundary crossing events as much as possible. For example, if you have a remote procedure call, uh, application data friend or message, right? It's fairly useless to wake up the application to receive only 99% of the data because all the application is going to do is just go back to sleep until he receives the remaining data in order to do anything useful. So you rather send him the whole thing instead of, hey, this 99% of the partial uh, friend. And the last one is the, again, system call overhead when a server suddenly need to write into 10,000 sockets of three bytes each. Um, and you want to find an efficient way to do this. An important part is the thread affinity um, because we're trying to process the packet on the same CPU uh, where the user threads also runs. Um, Sounds very intuitive and uh, obvious, uh, right? Um, but you want to make sure that um, you set the uh, core ID of the socket so where the receive message and send messages are called. And when you use them to set uh, the core ID on Paul, which we would remove, this heuristic don't work that well without like very careful orchestration. Um, because the schedule can move the user threads around and the previous user space threads uh, can get back blocked or pinned and doesn't work for all the processes. So that means uh, you just need to do a lot of careful profilings and look at really the uh, application workload uh, in order to optimize all these different uh, bottlenecks. And what you really want to try to do is you process the TCP events at the same core both in the user and the kernel. And sometimes this can tie down to really detail of how the particular CPU works and how the cache line works. So here is a, a, a simple example, right? Like you have uh, two cores um, and you receive the packets uh, from one side um, and then basically you put them in the memory um, of that core and then it, Unfortunately, then you need to process them in a different place. Um, then that's a lot of overhead already uh, to cross these boundaries. And this can go really undetected for the applications. So they have like really little visibility of what's going on. But yet what they see is uh, a high CPU um, uh, usage. And maybe they have some CPU quotas that would really limit it. Um, their um, sort of a throughput. So like you can see, that's just one example. Uh, for example, another one is that you can have uh, soft uh, RRQs on CPU zero and the user code on another CPU cycles for extra copy. Um, this could also put a lot of overhead in this uh, particular server. And I think basically what I want to show here is that there could be just like multiple bottlenecks uh, in all these different hosts and where you would do a lot of profiling in order to resolve them. And it varies uh, among different applications as well. And let me give you a more precise example. Uh, for ex example, some applications that on the send side, it needs to send a lot of data and essentially from the application to the RPC stack memory, that could be pretty efficient, but the expensive part, expensive part comes from, from the RPC stack to the kernel memory where you do a lot of copy from user. And those is where you need to apply some techniques like a TCP zero copy, which is fully supported in our Linux kernel, um, but it can come with caveats uh, as well. Uh, for example, um, some of the cache services, right, 
it will sound like, oh, cache services is the best example to use TCP zero copy. But because it's a cache service, the page actually has a lot of ref count. So in this case, it may not be that sort of a big saving to use zero copy, a regular copy could be actually better than uh, using a zero copy uh, because of the ref count activities on that particular page. Um, Using another example is on the other side uh, for TCP receive zero copy is that uh, when you have uh, big packets and those packets can turn into single pages and you can use the zero copy to really relieve the receive side bottlenecks. And we have found this to be actually more generically available or applicable to most of the applications where the receive side is offered the choke points um, for like it says, especially like storage servers, for example, that needs to receive like a big chunk of data. Then I want to move to more like the TCP telemetry, which we also spend a lot of time on, because again, as I mentioned before, uh, we find fun that a lot of time it's, you have to profile the application and you have to let the application know where the choke point is. And before we have to do uh, more features in this area, application usually can make sense of the TCP statistics. And the infrastructure side, the TCP people or the hosts, uh, the networking people can, don't have enough data to study application uh, performance. Right. Think of uh, what application sees on the left side uh, typically is, okay, our flow, uh, the TCP flow has some average RTT of 10 milliseconds and some loss rate and uh, average window is 31 packets. Um, this is complete cryptic to the application developers, what, what those means. Uh, all right, I don't understand what you're talking about. My message is not delivering to the other end quickly enough something is missing in between. Um, and that's when we want to really associate all these TCP flow level applications um, to the individual messages, right? Application data frames. Um, in the Google's case, we primarily use the RPC stack. So we do a lot of this uh, instrumentation at the RPC level so that we know, okay, for the particular message that you care about, your RTT is this and your loss rate, you're suffering a high loss rate so that both sides can start making sense of, is it the network or is it something in between? Um, so let me be more concrete of what we actually do log. Imagine you have a TCP sender who is calling a send message to send some block of data, likely a, a RPC request or response. So at the TCP queuing time, we start recording, okay, what's your current window and sending rate and your retransmission uh, status. Essentially do a snapshot of that particular TCP sockets. And then at the queue disk uh, time, and you cannot do the same. So you know that, okay, once the packet has traversed through the queue disk, again, you snapshot the TCP uh, stats. And you do that again, when the TCP act acknowledging your entire response has come back, then you can do a diff of this TCP socket um, stats, and then you can tell, all right, during this time when we are sending your message, something has changed. Maybe the loss rate, your message encounter very, very high loss rate, uh, for example. And let me show you what we will actually plot uh, to the application is this progressive timelines of, you know, what a message has been experienced and how much time it takes while it's traversing the whole stack on the sender side, on the receiver side. And with all this timestamp, then it's very clear that where are you spending most of your time? And surprisingly, we find that a lot of time it's not even that middle cloud, the network, um, the packet or the message was stuck in, say, the queue disk or stuck in even the RPC channel processing 
uh, pipeline because the application suddenly burst 10,000 messages and it has an artificial limit of how much buffer it has, uh, things like that. Uh, or the application message has been properly kernel has all processed that receive that and even acknowledge that in the receiver yet the application thread is sort of a starving uh, to pick up the data. So it's queuing on the receive side for several milliseconds. Uh, so this kind of visibility really help us to analyze individual applications of their choke point. And surprisingly that network uh, in my experience is probably only uh, less than a third of a time to blend. <laughs> a lot of time it's all this queuing in this uh, different stages of the pipeline. So I don't have time to talk about a lot more TCP optimizations that have been done uh, for the memory isolation. I highly recommend uh, you attend uh, the talk tomorrow at 3.45 that, uh, by Shaquille on the memory isolation. Uh, we have done sort of uh, specific topics in IETF uh, at different over the time, um, like TCP zero copy, um, also the big TCP, uh, with the bigger TSO GRO to allow uh, 200 Gbps networks. And there are interesting features uh, like uh, TCP silent close, where think of a server suddenly needs to be shut down or need to migrate and it needs to close hundreds of thousands of uh, connections. And sometimes this same flood can actually cause outages <laughs> of all these clients receiving it, uh, a very interesting uh, incident. And there is also a lot of development on the multi-pass TCP. Uh, also another talk uh, in tomorrow's afternoon, highly recommend. Um, another tricky issue we found is uh, the default Linux is really, the TCP is really tuned for the internet uh, performance. And that's why the minimum RTO is still 200 milliseconds. Um, this is definitely way too long for data center applications, but you cannot just reduce it, even though today IP route allows you to reduce that, because if you reduce that to say five millisecond, unfortunately you will retransmit very quickly for sure, but a lot of time those could be spurious because on the other side, the delay act in Linux DCP is still by default 40 millisecond minimum. So a lot of time the access delay is not, there's really no loss, but you are just spuriously retransmitting. So this kind of work, we are still going to, uh, we need to upstream our changes uh, to the links in order for everybody to benefit. And then there are also many other uh, cool features. I'll refer you to look into this uh, slide decks. Okay, I think I'll conclude with um, my talk with that. I think Linux TCP is still a major um, use sort of a transport vehicle in data centers, even though there's been a lot of this cool new uh, transport technologies uh, coming up with offload and all that. But a lot of part really can be replaced like Linux TCP, like a congestion control module and can be continue to optimize with eBPF. And I'll give you some challenge I think that would keep TCP to continue to survive and even maybe dominant uh, in the next uh, 10 years. I think we really need to put more focus on cross-layer optimization, like the application data unit uh, awareness. And now with EVPF, we can really do this uh, uh, in a more generic way. Uh, I'll give it another, um, just a small idea, right? If you think of a TCP and the congestion control window, it's completely by stream based. It has no concept of application data unit. For example, the congestion window is 10 packets. So he now sends 10 packets, but the application data unit is actually 11 packets. If you can just afford to send one more packet, then the other end can receive the entire data unit and it can immediately process that. But because of a TCP is stuck with this packet-based system, 
uh, you have to wait for uh, another round trip, right? So what if we can really optimize the TCP scheduling to be more application aligned with application data unit? I think that would be really cool. Um, the other is today compared to other uh, transport or kernel bypass transport, I think TCP suffers from small message processing, sending 200 bytes of data. Those can be highly optimized by the other transport, but things like uh, uh, IOU ring uh, provides really a great opportunity. So TCP can be equally as performance as those uh, transport as well. Then the last one is extending TCP protocol continue to be not easy because you, you basically have to get a new option number from IEPF and that process uh, takes several years. Um, any smart way to kind of improve that process can really introduce sort of a let TCP protocol uh, evolve a lot quicker. So, and that's the conclusion of my talk. Um, happy to take questions. Any questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.